Welcome, 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 everyone. The annoying voice on the microphone right now is Terry Tamanen. I'm the president and CEO of Alta C. Welcome to our open house. Thank you all for being here on a somewhat rainy Saturday before a holiday weekend. Everybody got pl good plans for Thanksgiving? Are you looking forward to it? Yeah? Yeah? Let's hear it for Thanksgiving. Come on. That was just to see if you were awake. Very good. So I, I think everybody who's here probably knows what Alta C is, but just in case there's some newcomers, we are a nonprofit that has this 35-acre peninsula all the way down to the south end down there that you're sitting in the west campus. This is birth 57. As you can see, birth 58, 9, and 60, which are all the way to the south along this line, 180,000 square feet of historic warehouses like this one are currently being renovated by Swinnerton, the big contractor, into a modern campus and hub for the blue economy. So that'll be for education, for workforce training, and importantly, to stimulate and grow the blue economy businesses. And when I say blue economy, raise your hand if you know what I mean. Okay, a few hands, good. Well, for those that may not know, and even for those that think they do, it might be more than you think because the ocean covers two-thirds of our planet. And yet most of our solutions to climate change and sustainability, if you look around, are on land. It's solar panels on a rooftop. It's Tesla cars charging to batteries, things like that that are all important things for our future. But like I said, 70% of the planet is water. So our future really depends on a healthy ocean. And that's part of what we work on here is climate solutions that will sustain us and the ocean for generations to come. Things like aquaculture, things that can happen right on land, even in warehouses like this where we can grow food and fuel and protein for the future, but also offshore in aqua farms. You could be a farmer in the open ocean and come back to land at night, live in a big city, unlike farmers in Iowa that have to live out in the rural areas. You could be right here in a big city and go farm every single day on a boat. Wouldn't that be fun? And, uh, and so all forms of aquaculture extracting, like I said, great food and fuel and other things from kelp, from seaweed. There's a, one of the companies here figured out how to pull an extract out of algae, a seaweed, and it makes a baking flour, so you can bake cookies and cakes and things like that, that's gluten-free and low glycemic index, so it's not sugary for people that have to worry about that. It's incredibly valuable coming out of something we can grow in the ocean. We also then work on renewable energy, so things like wave and tidal energy. We've got 30 companies from around the world in our wave and tidal alliance that just helped pass Senate Bill 605 and the state legislature to incentivize how to get more of that clean energy from the ocean deployed in California. So you're going to see much more of that in the coming years, helping us to decarbonize our atmosphere and our grid and become truly sustainable. We also work with hydrogen companies that you're going to hear about today. Some of the barges that are along our dock here are things that are pulling carbon out of seawater. You may have heard of direct air capture, where scientists are trying to pull carbon pollution out of the atmosphere, carbon that's caused global warming. Well, now we found you can do it faster, better, cheaper by pulling it out of the ocean. And one of the byproducts is hydrogen. You're going to hear a lot about hydrogen today. And another area that we focus on in the blue economy is blue technologies. So underwater robots, drones, sensors, et cetera. And you're going to see today, is there anyone here from Palos Verdes High School? Could we hear it from Palos Verdes High School? You are going to see some amazing students and their ROVs operated right off of the wharf here. You're going to get a chance to see underwater robotics, drones, the kinds of things that are going to be so important to us understanding our oceans and our planet in the future and protecting them for the future. So anyway, everything to do with the blue economy, then getting young people involved, making them better consumers, aware of this for the future, whatever walk of life they go into, uh, voters, consumers, et cetera, activists, people who understand the ocean are more likely to protect it. And then we hope some of them, like some of the students here today, will go into these blue economy jobs that we hope to create 
and we're working with 13 community colleges in certificate programs. So you can come right out of high school, get a certificate uh, by going to a community college in aquaculture. We have another one coming in underwater robotics and importantly one for hydrogen in the maritime economy. So why do I keep saying hydrogen? What is hydrogen? Hydrogen is the most abundant element in the universe. It's also the smallest molecule known. And so that's one of the reasons that it's kind of hard to manage, hard to do things with, but boy, is it a, an amazing tool. And we have got some people here today that are gonna talk to you about hydrogen. They happen to be women. And in the energy industry, it's kind of been a man's world for a long time. But guess who's making the biggest difference today? It's not the men. You're gonna hear from two very powerful uh, and impactful women today that are in the hydrogen economy and are making changes to make our world so much more sustainable, clean and green and blue. And the first of those, it's my pleasure to introduce Allison Hawkins, who's the general manager of the Hydrogen Mobility Division for Air Products, a great partner of us here at Altice. Let's hear it for Air Products. <laughs> All right. And Allison uh, joined Air Products as a participant in the company's career development program in 2000. So talking about career development, we want to hear about that for young people that may want to go into these careers. And after technical roles in environmental permitting, in chemicals manufacturing, and corporate technology, she tackled assignments spanning hydrogen pipelines to syngas, which she'll explain, to atmospheric products. She holds a Bachelor of Science in Chemical Engineering from Lehigh and earned a Certificate of Corporate Entre Entrepreneurship at Lehigh's University's College of Business and Economics. So talk about somebody who is really overqualified to be here. I mean, really, let's hear it for Allison. Thank you. Hello. Thank you, Terry, for that introduction and for bringing everyone together today. Um, you know. It's, uh, uh, as you said, you know, I, I've been with Air Products. I actually started as 1997 as a college intern. So um, I've been touching hydrogen for a long time and it's exciting to see how many people are interested in it now. So uh, I'll kind of explain what's driving some of that interest as we go. Um, but again, it, I'm a chemical engineer by trade. Um, very early in my career, uh, really leaned into more of the environmental angle and what a company like Air Products could do to try to help our customers improve what they were doing, make it more, uh, you know, less emissions, more energy efficient, and that's really been kind of w how we've grown in the 80 plus years that we've existed. I'll see if I can make this work. Might have to turn it on. There we go. So if you're here today, I probably don't need to preach to you, right? <laughs> but everything starts with why we're looking at hydrogen. And, and we're looking at hydrogen because we have a problem, right? Um, our, that problem is really driven by greenhouse gas emissions, uh, particularly CO2 in the atmosphere, right? So, um, so we start with that's, that's a given, and what does that mean? Uh, you know, we have to convert, convert to zero emission. Um, and as we're doing that, it's really underpinned by government policy, you know, mandates to convert certain things, corporate sustainability goals, so companies like our products that realize we're part of the problem, we're going to be part of the solution now, um, investor influence, so people who are, you know, buying and trading in stocks are trying to choose which companies to invest in, and if they're, if they're not doing things to clean up their, their act from a greenhouse gas standpoint, they're you know, a less interesting company to invest in. Um, and then there's people who are just doing the right thing. And uh, I would say you know, that's a lot of the, the consumers at the end of the day that are you know, throwing solar panels on their roof and choosing which vehicle to drive um, in a way that's more sustainable. So 
that's kind of what's making um, all of this that I'm going to talk to you about happen today. So when you sit here in California, you say, well, where are our, our greenhouse gas emissions coming from? And um, I don't know if all of you can see in the back, but you know this big blue, largest portion of the pie is transportation. Right? So how we move around is driving the largest share of our greenhouse gas emissions. Then we have 23% uh, in the upper corner, that's industrial, right? So making transportation fuels, um, you know, powering our houses, um, making you know, different uh, chemical end products. There's 11% from the electricity sector um, and 5% uh, of electricity that's imported to the state. Um, this smaller section, say ag, ag and forestry, commercial and residential, right? So if we're looking where are the sectors that we can focus on to try to drive, um, you know, reduction in the use of fossil fuels, it really is focused on that, like, industrial and transportation side um, of where we're going to get the biggest bang for our buck. Okay. So air products, as I said, they... Started up in 1940, you know, right around World War II, making oxygen, helped make a lot of steel that was important for the country at the time. But we've evolved and grown with what the customers need in this space. So we make oxygen, nitrogen, argon, helium, hydrogen. Those, those are really our main products. Um, and 60 years uh, has been our hydrogen, over 60 years has been our hydrogen business. Um, and I will talk a little bit about that. So we've been in California for over 30 years. So the reason why people really started to pick up the use of hydrogen was driven by clean fuels. Um, but it's not the clean fuels we're talking about today, right? So uh, I'll date myself here, but I remember watching the evening news and hearing about acid rain, right? And uh, acid rain was sulfur dioxide emissions um, coming out of the tailpipe. And the way that we as a country and world dealt with that is to desulfurize the gasoline. Turns out you need a lot of hydrogen to do that. So we built some of these large hydrogen plants, some right up the road from here still. You know, they were all done to you know, help desulfurize that gasoline and help deal with that acid rain issue. Um, so we've been here for, for over 30 years. We do have hydrogen fueling stations. So Air Products early on said, well, we gotta figure out what are all the potential uses for that? We got very involved in developing ways to safely um, uh, dispense hydrogen into a vehicle, um, built some of the very first fueling stations here in the state of California, and really helped drive some of the regulation around how um, that could all be done and managed safely. Okay, so let me talk about how hydrogen works in transportation. So most of you have probably heard of the term EV, right? So EV is an electric vehicle, uh, but there's two types of EV. There's battery electric and there's fuel cell electric. Um, the main difference in a battery electric vehicle, you know, they're charging that vehicle um, at a single point, you know, off the electricity grid or, you know, tied into um, a charge point. And then the whole time it's being driven, it's dissipating that energy as it goes. The fuel cell electric, it's still an electric motor that's driving that vehicle, but instead of charging in the wall, we're putting hydrogen into the vehicle. That hydrogen then flows through a fuel cell and it powers a battery in the vehicle while you're moving around, right? So rather than it just you know, starting with a really big battery and that's dissipating the whole time you're driving, you have a smaller battery driving an electric motor. So same zero emission on the powertrain, all you're doing is using hydrogen as that energy charge for the vehicle, okay? And so a real big benefit um, of why, why go to the difficulty to carry hydrogen around in your vehicle, right? It's really driven by weight of the battery, which in terms of, you know, hauling cargo around, is, it's all about payload, right? So if I'm driving, you know, if I'm pulling containers out of the port here, um, I can carry heavier weights with a hydrogen fuel cell vehicle than I could with a battery vehicle, right? Um, and as you go up in those duty cycles and the much larger things, you know, think train locomotives, you know, airplanes and the like, 
to get a large enough battery to power that thing through its use period, it would take up the whole weight of the vehicle, right? So, um, so as you get larger, the need to use hydrogen as that energy carrier uh, starts to, to really play a larger role. So just a picture for you. This is, this is the vehicle. I, I rode a Mirai Uber here today, so <laughs> very exciting to uh, talk to the driver. Um, but it was this car here, so it's a Toyota, Toyota Mirai. Um, and so this just shows you how the vehicle is set up. So those yellow sections, those are the hydrogen tanks, right? So when they pull into a station to fill, it's about a five to 10 minute event. You know, hydrogen goes into the, the tank. They can leave uh, as they're going down the road. That hydrogen is passing through a fuel cell, combining with air intake. So we need oxygen because you got the hydrogen and the oxygen are working together in that fuel cell. Out comes electricity and water vapor. So you see a little, sometimes on a cold day, you might see a little bit of uh, you know, fog coming out the back of the vehicle, right? Um, and then it's driving a, that small battery in the electric motor on the back, okay? So moving into, you know, we know hydrogen works. We know it's needed. And so what can, a, what can we do to try to enable the use of it to really grow from early demonstration to commercial scale, part of how we do business and use energy in this country? Um, so air products, um, you know, we've got about 23,000 employees worldwide. Uh, the hydrogen is, and the energy transition really is our growth platform that we're focused on um, delivering um, and putting all of that um, energy uh, towards that solution. And we've made a commitment to spend $15 billion on this clean energy transition by 2027. So we're actively building some of the world's largest demonstration and commercial scale station or uh, infrastructure around the globe. So when we think about how to make hydrogen for a clean energy, we got to think about the life cycle emissions, right? So if you are, you know, charging an EV at your home, you got to think about where is the power coming from and where, what are the upstream emissions that would go into producing that power to get it to you? We do the same thing with hydrogen. So if we're making hydrogen from natural gas, we've got to think of all the upstream emissions that come with getting that natural gas out of the ground and into the pipes. And then we have to look at the process emissions and then the downstream emissions all the way through how it's being used in that, in that vehicle. Um, so we talk about this in terms of like uh, well to wheels is, is really the transportation way to measure that, right? Total life cycle emissions of that. And there's different ways to make hydrogen, but if you're using gray hydrogen today, like those same plants we built to help default sulfurize gasoline, there's already an advantage in greenhouse gas emission reduction on a well-to-wheels basis. It can be greater, and we'll talk about how we get there, but there's already a benefit. And then the biggest benefit is you have zero tailpipe emissions, right? So if you think about communities that surround ports and the like, you know, we're breathing diesel emission, particulate, benzene, there's carcinogen in this. You can get rid of all of that by shifting right to uh, even a gray hydrogen. So I'll talk to you about the colors of hydrogen, <laughs> real simple, high level. Uh, so the way we produce it today is we start with natural gas, process it uh, using this steam methane reformation process. We end up with CO2 emissions going into the atmosphere, but again, like on that total well to wheels basis, it's a little cleaner than gasoline. Um, another way is to do that same process. We could still start with that abundant natural gas but if we capture the CO2 in the process and sequester it, so put it in the ground, then I've, I've captured it at an easier point to capture as opposed to trying to capture it out of everybody's tailpipe as they're moving around, right? So that is why blue hydrogen is discussed, right? It's just an easier way to capture the CO2. Um, and I'll talk, Air Products has some large projects that are incorporating that. And then the holy grail is all the way over on the right. This is green hydrogen. So now I can start with renewable electricity. I can use a process called water electro electrolysis. So I'm literally splitting water into hydrogen and oxygen, capturing that hydrogen. Now I've made hydrogen from renewable energy. 
and I haven't touched a fossil fuel molecule in that process, right? <laughs> so, so that is the direction we're moving on. And so when we talk about a carbon-free future, it's really you know, deeper and deeper blue, higher capture rates on those facilities, and then the green facilities that are using higher and higher percentages of renewable as their feedstock on the power. So this is where Air Products has, made, has large projects that we're developing right now as part of that, that $15 billion commitment that we've made. Um, so up in Alberta, Canada, we're doing a blue project. Um, we have announced a facility where we're producing sustainable aviation fuel with our partner World Energy um, here in, in Paramount, California. In Arizona, we're doing a green hydrogen project. So that's that water electrolysis using solar power. In Texas, we're going to work with a partner to put in new solar and wind power and take that to green hydrogen there with the electrolysis. And over in Louisiana, we're trying to decarbonize our industrial customers there through a, another blue hydrogen project. Okay. So really trying to push forward. Oh, and I'm skipping over New York. New York is hydropower going to green hydrogen. Um, so these are the announced projects in North America. I'd say there's a lot of activity going on that's not on this slide, but you know, we're trying to advance each of those methods of producing hydrogen um, so that we'll be able to scale them even quicker moving forward. So just a, a couple slides to dive into that, uh, that Texas project. It's so exciting. Um, putting The reason we're putting solar and wind there is we want to run our plant more than the hours of the day that the sun is shining. <laughs> so by co-locating those two, I now can run my facility as many hours of the day as possible, um, put in some battery technology to be able to run through um, downturns. Um, but that is, you know, that's, that's your, your best way to move away from having any emissions associated with your production. And we're doing that with a partner called AES, who's, who's very active in that development of renewables. And so what it looks like is, is the upstream wind and solar. This is over, uh, over a gigawatt of, of renewable power that's being installed. We convert that using that water electrolysis process and that um, it's about 200 metric tons a day of hydrogen, it's a very large amount. Uh, it's probably about 10 tons a day uh, total dispensed in California right now into vehicles. So this is 201 project. <laughs> we'll talk about why. Um, and so where that can be used in downstream um, uses is we have industrial customers today where we can supply them with green instead of gray and help drive some of their scope three emissions out of their processes. And then primarily we can take that over into transportation markets. Um, so things, bus, truck, you know, passenger vehicle, rail, aviation, um, and marine. So one of the things that Air Products is really famous for is the cryogenic technology. So we take gases and we liquefy them. So we distill them, um, think making it colder and colder and colder until that gas turns into a liquid. And then the reason we do that is we can transport it in a much more dense format. Okay. Once we've done that, it allows us to take that energy further distances for lower cost. Um, it allows us to build that dispensing refueling infrastructure that's going to work really well and reliably off of that liquefied gas. Um, and that results in kind of an improved storage at, at the point of use, which all drives for higher reliability. So think your, your transportation markets today for fuels, they're liquid fuels, they're driven in a truck, they're put in that underground storage tank at the fueling station. You never think about it when you show up. <laughs> you just know it's going to be there. And uh, liquid hydrogen is, is your best way to move hydrogen about to do that same thing. So we are, uh, like I showed on the earlier point, we have six existing stations that are small gaseous stations. Those were the part of the first demonstration states in the state of California. We have another station up in Orange County in Santa Ana supplying buses right now, and that's using this liquid hydrogen technology. Right? Um, and so that allows us to do more vehicles a day. It has more throughput, more capacity. And so we have a design to carry that forward into 
larger infrastructure throughout the state of California to start to enable all of that, you know, connected delivery of goods, you know, people um, all around to every part of the state. Oops. And I'll, I, I'll point out on here, you know, we need people to make this happen, right? So we have local construction resources, we have local technicians. So our technicians that keep the stations running reliably for the end customers. Um, and so we're working closely with some of those organizations that Terry named because we need to train this workforce, this next generation to keep up with all of this great infrastructure and keep it running um, for decades to come. Uh, and then our, um, our funding for some of these stations has uh, come from the state. So we've already this year received funding from the California Energy Commission and from uh, an Energize program, which is administered through CalStart. And that is for us to put in infrastructure that'll serve both light duty vehicles and heavy duty vehicles to support adoption. So my favorite hydrogen station we have, this is at our headquarters in Pennsylvania. So uh, my point here is California is really where this technology is being developed and proven and it's gonna, it, it's gonna succeed here and then move out, right? So California drives the entire rest of the country in terms of setting how we, you know, how we get to the next plateau of decarbonization. So we have amazing support in state and we need, you know, kind of an all of abo the above approach to get everybody making this possible. Uh, the DOE just funded seven hydrogen hubs across the country to try to help replicate that in other regions. Um, California received one of those hubs uh, through a group called Arches. And uh, we're just super excited to see where this goes. And I can take questions if you have any now. Okay. Thank you so much. We'll do questions at the end for everybody. Uh, and before we get to our next speaker, I do want to, uh, first of all, recognize the Alta C staff, anybody in a blue t-shirt and some who aren't in a blue t-shirt, raise your hand if you're with Alta C. Great. Give them a great big round of applause for all the hard work they do throughout. And speaking of great women leaders, we have one of the co-founders of uh, Alta C here, Jenny Crusoe, who many of you know. Jenny is our, our COO and executive vice president, but really one of the founders here, Robin Aubey. We have so many wonderful women leaders here. Give them a great big extra round of applause. We've also got a, a special guest here who I'm going to introduce in a moment, but I would like to ask Tina Calderon to come up for a moment. We usually start with this, but I, uh, my bad. We should have started from the very beginning with the land acknowledgement. And so let me introduce Tina Calderon, who is our cultural advisor and culture bearer. Thank you, Tina. Mi'i hane hinka, ne tuanya ne Tina Orduno Calderon, ko mikre bet na ha tongve, ko i mixkanakan, ko yo eme. A wesh kone ha ko ava manete ho betamet. That is the language that was spoken here initially. We, today we call it tongve, or tongva, as many of you have heard. And what I said to you is, hello, my relatives. I'm Tino Arduno Calderon. I'm Gabrielino Tongva, Ventureño Chumash, and Yoeme. And I'm really happy to be here with all of you today. Um, I do like to start with acknowledging my tribal relatives, past, present, and emerging. They're the original Tarahatam, or peoples of Tobangar. And Tobangar is our word for world but it encompasses the world that we knew, which is our territory as well. If you've ever heard of the Tongva, many people know that we um, were the people of the Los Angeles Basin, but they don't realize that we have a very huge territory that spanned from San Fernando Valley all the way south into Orange County, along, um, east along the Santa Ana River to Corona and Riverside, and back along the foothills. And we also held the four Southern Channel Islands. We were boat people. We had uh, both freshwater boats made out of tule, and we had sewn plank canoes called tiots that took us to Catalina Island, which is our village of Pimu, uh, Pimuna. And um, we were mountain people. We were uh, foothill people. We were coastal people. We were prairie people. We had such a large territory, right? 
And I'm really, really so grateful to my ancestors because they taught us important lessons about living in reciprocity with the lands and the waters and causing no harm, right? We had very strict laws about how to be good relatives and good caretakers to the lands. And if we had continued to practice that, we wouldn't be looking for all these solutions now to fix what has happened in such a relatively short time. But gratitude to those um, scientists that are working on this to try to make things better. And, um, you know, we just try to stay at the table and caution everybody that we do need to do things. We need to be strategic. We need to improve things. But we also have to do, have to do it without causing more harm, right? So sometimes we have to slow down a little bit and we have to think about the relatives that we're utilizing to turn it into energy. Uh, because these are relatives, they're not just resources. And that's such an important teaching. So thank you for this time. I'm gonna go ahead and just offer an ancestor song. Um, when we talk about our ancestors, and this particular song I'm going to share, it talks about how our ancestors were here, right here. We had many villages around here, and the closest and largest was Suwanga. Um, so um, the song is going to be talking about those ancestors. But when we talk about ancestors, it's not just humans. It's all life in the four directions. So those plant relatives, Moma, the ocean, all the beautiful life that's within the ocean, those are our relatives, so we acknowledge them as well. Eya kono hink mo, honu vet mo, atu mech mo, honu vet mo. He 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 oh. Eya hinkem, honu vet me, wante kwa, wante kwa. Eya hinkem, honu vet me, wante kwa, wante kwa. Thank you to all of you and thank you to all of our ancestors and have a good rest of your day. Thank you, Tina. I think one of the most important messages, not only another powerful woman leader, thank you, but another uh, important message, you know, we tend to think about our Native American ancestors here on this site as those tribes are gone, that, you know, sa sadly, uh, the, the colonists came here and wiped them out, but they're not gone. I think Tina will be the first to tell you, and she has a great table right there exhibiting some of the work that she's doing, that the Tongva people, the Chumash, the Gabrielino are still very much here very much active in trying to help us restore our environment and learn from the past and not make the same mistakes in the future. So thank you again, Tina. Before we get to our other speaker on hydrogen, I want to introduce a special guest who, you know, we don't just let any politician come up here and, and bend your ear. But the ones that used to be the CEO of Alta C, we make an exception for them because we have a very special warm place in our heart for those that have gotten us to where we are today and who are going to help us now in an even bigger platform make our city, our region much more sustainable in the future. Please welcome Councilman of the 1-5, Tim McOsker. Thank you, Terry. Thank you, Jenny, for inviting me. It's really lovely. And thank you so much uh, for uh, that acknowledgement is beautiful. Uh, it is wonderful to begin or almost begin every event acknowledging the, the, uh, our relatives that have come before us, all living beings, including human creatures. And um, may the work of all to see repair and honor the ancestors. So thank you for that. 
So my name is Tim McCosker, and I'm the councilman of the 1-5, which includes uh, San Pedro. I say 1-5 because I have the honor, and I'll be very quick, don't worry, we'll get to the real experts. I have the honor of, of, of being the councilman of one district, one beautiful district, representing five beloved communities. I represent Watts, 13 miles from here, but affected by what we do here. I represent the Gateway. I represent Wilmington, Harbor City, and my hometown of San Pedro. And we remind ourselves every day, every way, that everything we do has to inure to the benefit of everybody in the district. And that's sort of an Alta C message. Because Alta C is many, many, many things. And it is about saving the world, no less than saving the world. But for me, as a public official, it becomes important in such a critically new way for me. Because as I sit on the city council, I have the responsibility collectively with the mayor and with the council to make sure that we can meet our goals, we can meet our goals to stop destroying the environment, to stop destroying the, the, the planet. And we have a goal by 2030 that we are going to have zero emissions equipment all around this busy industrial complex. We have a goal that by 2035, we're not going to be polluting the environment with our trucks coming and going. And we haven't stated the goal yet, but we should have the goal to make sure that all of the ships that we receive and all the ships that we send out are not emitting carbon. And so those are really, really, really lofty goals. And we need partners because we're not the experts. And Alta C and Alta C's partners and folks in the industry and folks that are in the environmental community and folks across the planet really need to be our partners. And so I am so counting on all of our ingenuity and the the women that you're hearing from today who are pushing the limits of hydrogen are part of an enormous part of that calculus. Because as we sit here today, the reality check is as we sit here today, there is no way that the Department of Water and Power can provide enough power by 2030 or 2035 to make sure that we can plug in all of our stuff, if that stuff even existed. So to meet our goal, we're going to have to do everything we possibly can. And I believe, I'm not speaking for my colleagues, I'm not speaking for the rest of the political world in Los Angeles, but I believe and I will fight to make sure that we use every tool and hydrogen and renewable, renewable, hyd renewable energies, but hydrogen has to be a huge, huge, huge part of this. So thank you so much to Altice. First, for remembering where we came from and acknowledging the first peoples here, but also for working to repair the world. So thank you. I'm really appreciative. It would be a small part of all to see. Not such a small part. Thank you, Tim. Um, I wish all of our political leaders were as, uh, as open-minded and creative and sustainability-minded as you. So we now have the pleasure of introducing the other side of the hydrogen equation. You've heard about how hydrogen could be used in transportation. But how could it be used to power our homes and our businesses? And before we get to our next guest, you might have noticed in that slide that Allison presented that green hydrogen will be, say, solar and wind power electrolyzing water to break the H2 from the O, H2O, right, to get the hydrogen. And you might say, well, wait a minute, we live in a place with a lot of drought. Where are we going to get all this water? Well, you might be interested to know that in Los Angeles County alone, our sewage treatment plants dump over a billion gallons of wastewater every single day into the Pacific Ocean. Spend a lot of money to pump it here. We use it, goes to the sewage treatment plant. We have to clean it. We pump it seven miles offshore. All of that takes a lot of energy and resources. If we were to electrolyze that billion gallons a day, we could get enough hydrogen to power the entire United States transportation fleet. Now, obviously, we wouldn't do that from just Los Angeles. But that means there could be a lot of hydrogen from something we're literally throwing away every day, a valuable resource, to power our homes and businesses and transportation and show other cities who have a sewage treatment plant how they, too, could go into the hydrogen business. You don't have to put the oil companies out of business. Just give them this new product instead of them having to go halfway around a globe to dig up oil and transport it and spill it and pollute and refining it and the rest of it, they could go into the energy business and help us, but then you got great 
companies like Air Products that already know how to do this. They don't need to be an oil company, but there's plenty of ways to deliver this to us, but the cities could help produce the hydrogen, give it to the other companies then to use and, and to retail to us, et cetera. So all of the pieces are there if we just bring them together. And that's why I'm so excited to introduce Katrina Regan, who's the engineering and technology development manager for something called Angelus Link, which she will describe. It's a proposed open access common carrier for clean renewable hydrogen, a pipeline system that could serve our whole region for all of these purposes, but including for, uh, for energy production. And over the last 12 years, she's had various engineering, planning, and coordination roles in gas controls and system planning uh, for uh, Southern California Gas. And Katrina received a bachelor's in civil engineering from Loyola Marymount, a master's in business administration with a dual emphasis on finance and information technology from the University of Massachusetts Lowell, and a graduate certification in renewable energy engineering. So this is somebody who really knows what she's talking about. Let's give a warm welcome to Katrina. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Um, let me see here. Okay. Perfect. So I'm, I'm so thrilled to talk to you today. Thank you so much, uh, Altice, and, and uh, for including me and allowing me to, to chat with you and share my story. Um, I'm really glad Allison spoke earlier because I think she did some of the heavy lifting here, uh, just telling you more about hydrogen. So um, today, I, I really wanted to share with you um, my journey to where I am, um, tell you more about our, our project, and um, answer any questions that you may have. So uh, my name's Katrina Regan. I'm the Engineering and Technology Development Manager at SoCal Gas for our project called Angelus Link. And Angelus Link is a proposed open access uh, clean renewable hydrogen pipeline system. So it's a new energy network in Southern California that targets those uh, decarbonization of hard to electrify parts of our economy. So I'd like to share with you the story of how I got here, um, the work we're doing, and, and why it's important. So um, if I take you back to the beginning of my journey, um, it kind of starts with an unexpected twist. Um, when I originally am from New England, and I came out to California when I received a scholarship for, for school, and I attended Loyola Marymount University. Um, where I, I thought I would major in communications and I would go on to do international relations, something that involved travel. Um, and oddly enough, there was a bit of a mix-up with my schedule, and I ended up in calculus. And if you uh, know anything uh, you know, about uh, math, you'll know calculus is a, a little bit more math than you maybe need for a communications uh, <laughs> program. And uh, I... I found myself in a, in a class that was a bit of a stark contrast to uh, what I thought I would be engaging in. Um, and, and math didn't come easily to me. It was never my favorite subject. I know sometimes when you think of scientists and you think of engineers, maybe you picture somebody in your head who's very specific and who, who really likes math and who just gets it. And, and you think to yourself, like, I'm, that's not me. I, I don't think I can do that. Um, and I was probably one of those people. I didn't think that math came naturally to me and I didn't like it. But um, I found myself in this class and um, halfway through the semester, don't ask me why it took so long, but I realized everyone in the class already knew each other. And I, I realized they knew each other because they were all engineering majors. They were all engineering freshman students. And so they took a lot of the same classes together already and they came to this class. And um, I, I kind of, it was a little bit of an eye-opening moment for me um, because not only did I feel like I belonged, I was getting it, right? So. I realized I, I liked the people from this class, um, and I liked them more than I liked some of the other folks in my other classes. Uh, and I, I realized that engineers as a whole have a lot in common, right? They're, they're logical to a, to a fault sometimes, um, driven by data, uh, and they're eager to find new solutions to old problems. Um, and so if that sounds like you, you know, maybe you would be interested in engineering and maybe you would be interested in pursuing something in science, even if you've already studied something different. 
So one day, one of my friends in the class, one of my peers, uh, Sophia, suggested to me, she said, why don't you just switch to engineering? Uh, and I, I thought to myself, I, I took a little bit of time to think about it, um, but it, it kind of felt like a no-brainer. Um, and I switched uh, within, I think, a week. I went to the office of the registrar and I had to go through the process of figuring out what classes they needed to change, what, what summer school classes I now needed to take. And um, it really changed my life dramatically. Um, but embracing the unknown felt right in this instance. It felt um, very empowering because it was something I realized I knew I wanted to do. I wanted to be a part of problem solving and I wanted to, to try to make things and, and change that affected people um, all around me. And you can do that through engineering and through this kind of work. So. Um, it kind of it carved the path that I, I really walk today, and I'm always very supportive of encouraging people to join um, to join me on that path. All of you, you know, this is really something that we can all do together, and you need a whole variety of different skills and perspectives to do it. So um, I, I pursued engineering. I kept going, and then during my junior year of college, I realized, you know, what I need to start thinking about what I'm going to do. I need a job. I need money. And um, so CalGas was at a career fair at my college, and I gave them a paper resume, which in today's world is uh, not as common, right? We email everything. But I gave them a, a paper resume, and when I got the call to come and interview a month or so later, I had completely forgotten about it, honestly. Um, but when I had that, that opportunity to start talking with them, I realized a lot more that I didn't know, and I found everything I learned very interesting. So for example, um, back in New England where I'm from, uh, I don't know who my gas company is. I have no knowledge of what happens to bring the energy to my house. Nowadays I do, but when I lived back there, I really didn't know. Um, and out here, when you talk to almost anybody, they know, oh yeah, the gas company. It's one company. Right? So one company affects millions of people every day. Uh, and I think that uh, when I started realizing that, I knew, you know, I think I should take this opportunity. I think I can make this work. I think I'm, I'm interested in this. And um, the solutions that we develop, how they actually do change people's lives every day, is just both humbling and exhilarating. Um, so when people turn on the hot water at home or when they go to cook something on the stove, um, they need the energy that comes out to be there. And 12 years later, I'm, I'm still here and I'm still driven by that same passion to problem solve and to affect millions of lives in a positive and beneficial way. But my focus has really started to shift toward the renewable side of our business. Um, why renewables? We've had so many good conversations today already about why renewables. Um, but for me, it's because there's something really undeniably exciting about the early stages of getting involved in a project. Um, and in this case, with hydrogen, really a burgeoning industry. It's been around for a long time, but the momentum and the interest around hydrogen today is just at levels that have never before been seen. And um, there's, there's a huge amount of expected growth over the next couple decades. So it's exciting to be a part of that um, because there's creativity, uh, there's problem solving, there's a, this sense of urgency, and yes, there is a little bit of chaos, but you know what? It's the good kind, right? It's the chaos that really um, heralds innovation and change, and we need that as we, as we go on this journey together. Um, so, uh, a few years ago, I pursued a graduate certification program in renewable energy engineering, and I turned my attention to hydrogen. Um, and as a civil engineer, I've always loved building things. So um, with hydrogen, we're not just building, right? We're creating infrastructure from scratch. Uh, we're not retrofitting, we're innovating. Um, it's like constructing a house from the foundation up, except the house has the potential to really reshape our energy landscape. So what an exciting, fascinating, and just, you know, a, an opportunity beyond belief to be able to get involved with, um, not just for myself, but for everybody right now um, during this energy transition. And so this, this constant passion that I had always held kind of came face to face with my work at SoCalGas and uh, where I was working in gas control. 
right? I was coordinating projects on this huge gas system. Um, we have over 100,000 miles of pipeline. We serve over 21 million customers. And um, I was constantly tasked with both um, you know, project success, but also uh, protecting system reliability and resiliency, which are key, right? And so problem solving met my passion. And when I learned about our company's project called Angelus Link, I knew I needed to get involved. All right, so let me tell you a little bit more about Angelus Link. So Angelus Link is our proposed open access, clean, renewable hydrogen pipeline system. Um, the project, when you think about it, is split into three phases. So we have uh, phase one, phase two, and phase three. Uh, phase one is really laying the groundwork. It's our feasibility studies. So we're really looking to create a comprehensive picture of what does this look like? What does this pipeline system and what does the transportation of hydrogen in utility scale quantities look like in our, in our landscape here today? And then phase two really starts getting into the design. What, what are the design elements that need to happen look like? Um, and where is this pipeline um, going to be going first? And then phase three really brings us into our long lead permitting, uh, CPCN application, and, and other types of mechanisms that need to be addressed. So phase four, right, would kind of be construction. And so when we're thinking about that on a conservative timeline, uh, we may have hydrogen pipelines installed for utility scale delivery in 2030. Um, so in January of this year, we were able to kick off our phase one activities. And so um, I'm part of that team working on the different uh, work streams. We have 16 different studies that are currently underway right now, and they're broken up into three different groups. So first we have market development, right? Our market research group. Um, where is the hydrogen being made? Who is going to be using it? And, and that's a really strong question because right now there are so many new applications and there are new technologies that are coming about every day in ways that allow different types of industry to decarbonize in ways they've never even before considered. So there's a huge amount of different opportunity to engage with there. And um, as we start thinking about um, you know, sustainability and really carrying that through, there are different methods for producing hydrogen um, and, and kind of learning more about those, where they're taking off and where they're expected first is really critical to a pipeline project, obviously. So that's really our, our first area of work. Our second area of work is all of our regulatory, environmental, and policy-driven work streams. So that's looking, again, at all of the amazing uh, benefits that come from uh, changes in air quality around hydrogen. So uh, we have work on uh, GHGs, um, looking at greenhouse gas emissions, right? Looking at NOx, um, looking at hydrogen leakage and what, what effects that potentially has. Uh, but then also just doing traditional environmental studies, right? On what, uh, what considerations do we need to make around the areas where we're thinking and considering of putting pipeline. And then lastly, we get to my group, and this is the area I think is most exciting, but I am slightly biased. Um, this is the engineering and technology. So um, I have the wonderful opportunity and the joy to be able to take my work, which is um, pipeline routing, pipeline sizing, workforce, and safety, and really integrate it between all of the other amazing work and studies that are being completed as part of phase one. So when we think about where a pipeline goes, we need to know where the hydrogen is being produced. We need to know where it's being used. We need to know what the environmental considerations are along that specific route. So it really starts bringing in everything together in those engineering studies. So I feel very lucky and very grateful to be a part of that work. Um, we expect to continue moving through this phase one of the project. Um, we're currently about midway through, and we expect to publish all of our various studies uh, toward the middle of next year. So definitely stay tuned for more information on that. All right, so with that, if you have additional questions about Angelo's link, feel free to use the QR codes to scan them or to reach out if, you, if you're just, excuse me, just curious. Um, the hydrogen economy is, is at our, our doorstep, right? Uh, today, there are over 1,600 miles 
of hydrogen pipeline that are already in operation today in the US. And projects like Angelus Link uh, are pushing that boundary even further. Hydrogen isn't just a fuel, right? Um, it's a great fuel, but it's also the key to deeply decarbonizing our society. Uh, it can revolutionize uh, power generation, mobility, especially in heavy duty trucking, um, and even energize industrial and manufacturing sectors that require massive amounts of energy inputs that are just impractical or um, non-operable uh, using electricity. Um, hydrogen also has a lot of momentum. Um, if you look at the global scale and you look at all of the acceleration of hydrogen in places like Europe, where it presents very valuable energy security for different countries, um, you can see that they're already proposing operational pipeline by, by 2025, so even sooner uh, than in the US. But in the US, um, closer to home, um, Look at that, the, the recent federal announcement, right? $7 billion worth of funding um, going to those regional hydrogen hubs to accelerate that uh, domestic market for low cost, clean hydrogen. Um, we're so excited, you know, that the state was awarded um, the $1.2 billion. And, and it's, a, it's a loud acknowledgement of the role that hydrogen can and should play in the reliability of our state's energy future. Um, it's more than just energy reliability and industrial benefits, though. Um, it's also about health. Every diesel truck we replace with hydrogen-powered alternatives means cleaner air and healthier communities for everyone. Um, we have the largest ports in the country here, right? And um, they serve such a vital and important role for both our economy and the folks who live and work around here. But the heavy-duty trucking corridors are not great in terms of what they bring to us right now. With the adoption of hydrogen into that heavy-duty trucking and mobility sector, we can see significant health benefits uh, for the entire state. So at SoCal Gas, um, we live by three values, right? Um, do the right thing, champion people, and shape the future. Um, our mission is to build the cleanest, safest, most innovative energy company in America. And this is reflected by um, some of our published sustainability plans, um, Aspire 2045, and our commitment as a company to be net zero by 2045. Uh, and this is a huge commitment for an industry that has been historically reliant on fossil fuels. Um, as an innovator, SoCalGas is engaged in a variety of activities. So while Angeles Link is a proposed 100% um, clean and renewable hydrogen pipeline system, other groups in our company are also exploring new technologies and research through our rd and program and um, opportunities around blending hydrogen with existing uh, natural gas in existing infrastructure. Um, and earlier this year in Downey, California, actually, um, SoCalGas unveiled our hydrogen innovation experience, which is a modular home that's connected uh, to an on-site microgrid where they, it produces its own hydrogen, stores it, um, converts it to electricity for use in the evening, and then um, blends it and mixes it with natural gas to power many appliances in the home itself. So. Um, all of the equipment, which includes things um, like you would find in your, your home, uh, range top, water heater, fireplace, dryer, um, all of this equipment commercially available today um, and the first uh, hands-on application of uh, technology blending hydrogen and natural gas in a home setting. Um, so while it's impossible to predict what the energy ecosystem will look like more than two decades from now, right? Because that's a, that's a tall ask. Predict what things will look like in 20 years. Um, we do know that it must be clean, it must be safe, it must be reliable, and it must be resilient. So uh, projects that SoCalGas is pursuing, like Angelus Link, and our hydrogen innovation experience really underscore that desire and commitment. Um, I stand before you as someone who found my own personal calling in the chaos that comes with change, and I've been fortunate to work with a company like SoCalGas um, that's at the forefront of this renewable energy transition. And I do have to tell you, you know, I, I've worked in a lot of male-dominated industries, and I do feel like in this renewable space, I have had the privilege to work with so many more women than I typically have before. Um, it's really been an amazing experience. 
Um, so, so as we move forward, you know, um, remember that all of us, we all play a role in this transition. Um, and your support, your interest, um, enthusiasm, your desire for change, um, that really drives us forward. Um, so I'm just one piece of, of a much larger puzzle, and it's a puzzle that we're solving together towards sustainability and a clean energy transition. So thank you so much for your time today, um, and thank you all to see for all the amazing work you do. Thank you, Katrina. And before we get to Q&A for both of our guests or anyone else who's here today, uh, I want to acknowledge, I didn't see him before, but we are actually graced to have one of the Port of Los Angeles Harbor Commissioners, Lee Williams, with us. Lee? We normally recognize our dignitaries in advance. I'm sorry I didn't, uh, didn't see you sneak in. Uh, but now let's do that. We, and by the way, we have a live stream. I don't know if there's any way for the live stream folks to even ask questions. Uh, Robin here has the microphone, but we want to make sure your question is heard by the live stream. So anybody have... You can type in the chat, I'm told. Yes, very good. So anybody on the live stream can ask questions as well. So of either of our guests or anyone else. Go ahead. Who's got a question? Um, looking at hydrogen, okay. and a couple of folks had mentioned the, you know, reviewing the leaks and what that looks like on the impacts on the environment and our ecosystems. And I would be curious, up to this point, what has those studies shown around the impact of those hydrogen leaks um, on these pipelines and other channels? Great. Let me ask our two guests to come on back up here so we can use the mic. And either one of you that wants to tackle that one first, or you both have an answer. You have a little time to think about it as you walk up here. <laughs> I'll, I'll add a little bit and then I'll invite Allison if she has anything additional. Um, as part of our phase one studies for, for Angelus Link, we are conducting a study specifically on hydrogen leakage and assessing what that potential implication could be. Um, we do know already that um, you know leaks from, from methane and other greenhouse uh, gases are, are quite, uh, we have established the negative impacts that those have. So I'm really interested to, to learn more and definitely publish our findings. I would just add that it's also um, something that's being studied at the national labs right now. So follow with like DOE and, and the national labs to see what they publish. Yeah. Thank you. Other questions? Go ahead. Hi, good morning. So I think my question's for Allison. Um, so when you discuss the blue hydrogen, I'm just curious why the, or if you have any infrastructure set up to do, um, take it a step further with CO2. So I know you bear, you talked about bearing it. So if you do CO2 reduction, which would be another, um, you know, just taking it that step further to make methanol and ethanol and all these chemical fuels. Yeah, great question. So it, with carbon capture, people usually say CCUS. So it's carbon capture, utilization, and sequestration. So you don't necessarily have to sequester it. There are uh, additional products you can take it to. Um, I'd say that, you know, those, um, those technologies aren't yet at the same scale of the amount of CO2 that we're capturing, so we can't sink all of it into utilization today, but I think over time that will catch up and you'll have a lot more balance of, of they call that carbon closing the recycle loop. So you're, you're sequestering it, you're utilizing it and capturing it again on the back end, not generating additional CO2. And as somebody who drinks a lot of Diet Coke, I can tell you I am a carbon dioxide sequestering <laughs> entity um, until I burp it back up. Um, all right, TMI. Another question right there. Yeah, I was curious to know more about the Angelus Link project. Um, my ears definitely perked up during the introduction. We talked about, or we heard a little bit about the potential of wastewater reuse. Um, but then we didn't hear anything more about that. Um, and I was wondering if you could, I understand that it's still in uh, feasibility study, but if you could tell us any more detail about what it, the project actually is, that'd be really cool. Absolutely, thank you so much. So um, Angelos Link is a really at its heart, it's an energy transportation system. So we're talking about a pipeline network uh, that would connect those third party producers of clean renewable hydrogen 
with the demand and the offtake. So uh, folks from various different energy sectors uh, were really looking primarily at those hard to decarbonize and hard to electrify sectors like power generation. Um, so when we think about the dispatchable load for power, um, when we think about um, heavy duty trucking and mobility, um, different kinds of operating equipment that really um, either from an operation standpoint, um, you know, electricity or battery, it just isn't going to work for them. Um, so, uh, and then lastly, our, our manufacturing and industrial. So that's gonna be those high heat processes potentially um, or other uh, infrastructure and industrial activities where um, it's just impractical to electrify. Um, in terms of the wastewater usage, so I do love that metric. Thank you so much, Terry. Um, when we think about hydrogen production and we think about clean, renewable hydrogen, quite frequently, you know, you're thinking about electrolysis, right? Green hydrogen, that's the most common hydrogen production that you're gonna hear about. And um, you take water molecules and you split them, right, into the hydrogen and the oxygen. Well, when we are discharging billions of gallons of water to the ocean every day, that's a huge missed opportunity. Um, even if you take half of that, um, let's say you have to clean it up and purify it in order to run it through an electrolyzer, um, that's still a huge opportunity for, for the generation of hydrogen molecules. So while SoCal Gas isn't planning to be a producer, of that hydrogen, we do expect to see a lot of people taking advantage of that now that um, we know um, there's another opportunity and use case for it. And I would just add to that that, um, that obviously this is something that's still in its newest uh, form because um, you, you do have to clean it. You do have to have a very clean hydrogen to run it through a fuel cell, for example, even to, to combust it. And so that's something here at Alta C that we want to experiment with and demonstrate where uh, we will have, uh, hopefully we've got two megawatts of solar, as I mentioned, on our rooftop, which is more energy than we're using. So we could use some of that excess energy, clean energy, to electrolyze wastewater that could be trucked in from the Terminal Island sewage treatment plant just for, I mean, you wouldn't do that on a regular basis, but you could truck it in for experimental purposes to see uh, what are the kinds of technologies you need to clean up that, that water? Same thing with seawater. That's another potential. And again, where you know, there's problems with, uh, with environmental problems with sucking in so much water and, and entraining and entrapping larvae and, and plankton and so forth. But if you have a use like a power plant that's already got a permit, has already taken steps to mitigate the environmental damage, and is pulling in a lot of seawater for cooling, before you discharge that back out, you could potentially use some of the seawater to turn into hydrogen. But again, there's a lot of salt in that that would have to be taken out. So we want to be a place to experiment with that and learn how to make green hydrogen from, from more sustainable and renewable sources. Again, water being very scarce in a place like California. Other questions? Thank you. Um, as someone who worked at Hughes many years ago and worked on fuel cell projects, and then listening to Schwarzenegger, I don't know how many years ago that was, announcing this uh, giant network of fuel stations, the challenge still seems to be access to fuel and having the stations. Are you working with car companies? Who's working with car companies? Who's leading that charge? If either of you could speak to that, I'd love to hear Allison, it. Allison, probably up to you. Yeah. Yeah. So. Uh, as far as the, the capacity that we have to dispense in the state of California today, I think the bottleneck there is the stations and, and not the molecules. We have abundant molecules to bring to market. Um, and there are additional stations being built every day. Um, when I do talk to OEMs about that next class of vehicles, so um, that Toyota Mariah I showed, it takes about four or five kilograms per fill. Um, a commercial truck will be 50 kilograms, right? So there's gonna be a huge step change in demand, and so we have to be very thoughtful about how we, how we get that infrastructure out there at that scale quickly enough to, to make that adoption happen without major growing pains. And I think if I could supplement um, Allison too, um, I think as we think about you know pipeline infrastructure, that's also where you really start to see the benefits of the economy of scale. Um, to connect different offtake and provide a constant uh, source of, of hydrogen, too. Yeah. 
And I'll just add to that, uh, the reason you heard Arnold Schwarzenegger talk about it is because I was EPA secretary and was creating the hydrogen highway program, which was designed to bring stakeholders together. We brought 200 stakeholders together from the community, fire marshals, insurance people, as well as industrial companies and automakers and so forth to say, well, look, no one's going to bring the vehicles and the end uses if they don't have the fuel, and no one's going to bring the fuel if they don't have the end uses, so how do we grow those together? So the hydrogen highway program was designed to get the first 100 stations distributed across the state. We ran into some setbacks with the, uh, the recession in 2008, 9, 10, but it is very much back on track. We've got about 60 uh, public commercial stations. I drive the Hyundai Nexo, which is a fuel cell vehicle. Uh, my wife drives the Mirai, and uh, I've previously driven the Honda uh, Clarity, which is also fuel cell. Other car companies are bringing them to market. But um, the, as you heard, the volumes are not that great for you know, five kilograms of fueling, although thousands of cars adds up. But when you start getting trucks and here in the port container handling equipment, which today is, a, is mostly diesel and very polluting, if we want to clean up our air, uh, you can't always do that with batteries because of the recharging times, duty cycles, and not even being able to get enough electrons in to recharge all of that if it was battery but you can do it hydrogen electric, get the clean air benefits, and, uh, and then get the utilities uh, to provide hydrogen, get the, uh, uh, the end, end users to produce the container handling equipment that runs on hydrogen, and again, bring that uh, all up together. Other questions, let's take one or two more, and then uh, I'm sure our guests will hang around and answer questions individually, but we've got another exciting thing to get onto. Go ahead. Thank you so much. Hello, um, I'm here with the Niles Foundation today. I wanted to say first of all, thank you for both of your speeches. They're very informative and very exciting to see the direction that um, different industries are taking towards clean energy. Um, Katrina, when you were describing some of the mission statements of SoCal Gas, you mentioned championing people. And um, I think that's very exciting for a lot of us here today that are part of grassroots movements or part of um, nonprofit organizations trying to work in the space of sustainability. So I was just wondering if you could tell us all here, is there opportunities to collaborate with your offices, with your teams, to be part of those different phases? Because um, so much of doing great work is connecting community, and you guys have community, we all have community. So the more we can bring together, I think it would be really awesome um, if you could just speak to that a little bit. I would love to, and thank you for that question. Um, there is so much to talk about with Angela's link that I could probably talk for hours about it. Um, so this, this gives me a chance to, to talk about this very, very cool part. Um, so as part of what we're doing with this project, and, um, and as we were instructed to by the California Public Utilities Commission, we are partnering with external stakeholders already. Um, we have two different groups who we work with who are uh, composed of folks from outside the company. We have our planning advisory group, with it, which is composed of representatives from our various intervening parties, and also um, many energy agencies and, and organizations in Southern California. And then we also have our community-based organization stakeholder group, so our CBOs. And that's composed of representatives from various community organizations, nonprofits, environmental and social justice initiatives. So with these two groups, what we're doing, um, I find very exciting and a little provocative, um, is that we are bringing them into the conversation and we're collaborating even in this early phase one feasibility stage. Um, and if you have worked uh, with you know, large infrastructure projects in your past, um, or even if you've had them come into your community, um, you know that very frequently a project is already fully designed, developed, and they're coming to you to tell you that it is going in uh, next door. So um, what we're doing with this project is, as I, I mentioned, we're in the feasibility stages right now, right? We're really assessing what the hydrogen market looks like today, what the growth looks like over time. We're looking at where potential uh, energy corridors and routes could go and what do we need to consider in those corridors. And as we're doing all of this work, as we're in setting up these studies, we're engaging with these two external stakeholder groups and we're asking for feedback, we're asking for advice. We're saying, here's the scope of work we're gonna pursue, anything else we should add? What do you want us to consider additionally? Um, we shared our technical approach 
you know, what, what should we be considering differently? What do you think of the approach we're taking? Are there any areas we need to add more? And so as we go through this whole process, um, we're, we're meeting almost on a monthly basis, sometimes more than once a month, um, to, to share information and collaborate back and forth. So it's really exciting, and it is setting a blueprint, I think, for what a lot of these hydrogen projects are going to require. Um, hydrogen is something that not many people have heard of. I love that everyone in this room has, and I think we have Altasi to thank for that. Uh, but it isn't widely known, right? So these social engagements are going to be absolutely critical for hydrogen projects because people just lack awareness around what it can do and what it is as a fuel. So thank you so much for your question. Really excited with the work we're doing to partner, and that's specific to the project, but I know we are also partnering uh, with the community in a variety of other ways, so i can happy to talk about those with you also. Great, thank you. And uh, we'll take one more question, but I do want to also mention that we have about 15 or 20, speaking of community partners, tables here with uh, our community groups, our wonderful partners, uh, who as you, as we break up today, please spend time with them, learn more about what they're doing. They're all part of the Alta C family. So let's take one more question, I think from Jenny Crusoe. So this is a question for Terry. Oh. When do I get my hydrogen speedboat that you promised me? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a very good question. So we partner with another community group called Energy Independence Now which is a nonprofit that focuses on hydrogen in transportation. And they are, when we finish renovating uh, Berth 58 here in the first part of next year, they will be setting up a, a maritime hydrogen education center right here at Alta Sea so that we can invite members of the port community, members of uh, the surrounding Wilmington and Pedro and other communities around the port to come see how hydrogen would be used, how it's going to be produced, how to get engaged, with these projects and then how it can uh, help to decarbonize and clean up the air here. And one of those things, of course, is uh, vessels. And we've got a very exciting project that's uh, already underway in the Bay Area up in Northern California, a 75-passenger hydrogen fuel cell ferry, which that project is going to come down to be demonstrated here as well, we hope, very soon, uh, next year. And uh, uh, Honda has already built a speedboat. Uh, it's a beautiful 32-foot uh, speedboat powered by hyd hydrogen, so it's an electric boat just like my electric car, except again, instead of a battery, it's the electricity comes from the hydrogen. And so they've promised to bring that to us as a demonstration as well. So part of our Hydrogen Maritime uh, Education Center will, uh, will include the speedboat. Well, listen, <laughs> so look, on that note, I know there's many other questions, comments. We do want to engage, and I, I want to thank our speakers again, Allison and Katrina. I hope you can stay around a little bit more and answer other questions. Before, I, before we break, because we've got a very exciting thing that's going to go on outside, uh, I do want to mention, I'm sure you're all wondering, why is Terry wearing that hat that says Resilience C? Well, resiliency is our membership drive, and if you see our membership coordinator at the table uh, down here on your way out, you're going to learn about if you become a member of Altice, you can help all of our education, our workforce training programs, interactions like this, community engagement like we're doing. But guess what? Earlier I was kidding about getting $1,000 if you sit down. Well, you could win one of three amazing prizes if you join uh, the Resiliency membership program today, you could be part of uh, a, a raffle to win a Virgin Voyage for two, um, a stay uh, for two at the Terranea Resort, or a $1,000 Delta Airline voucher. And memberships come with a variety of other perks, and they last an entire year. So please, for more information and to help, you could even get a great cap or, or shirt or other great swag, please see our membership coordinators down there. And uh, once again, I just want to thank our partners who are at the tables here as, you, as we break, that you will all have a chance to talk with them and get involved in the community in other ways. But uh, the last part of our program today is out on the wharf. There is the ROV program of the Palos Verdes High, and the students are going to demonstrate if you, when you go out the door, if you just turn to the right, there will be volunteers there to point you down toward where the, the uh, activity is happening right outside this area here. And you'll be able to see them operate their underwater 
ROV and tell you more about it. So let's give them a great big round of applause. And I want to thank all of you for your interest, for coming here, for learning about this. Uh, you know, as you heard our guests say, hydrogen is not the most common thing in everybody's language. And if they have heard about it, it's confusing or uh, what is that all about? So you now are people who know probably more than 95% of most Americans and most people on Earth about hydrogen, how it's produced, how it will be used, and its potential for a clean and sustainable future. So please tell other people and tell them to come to Alta C. Thank you all for being here today. Enjoy the rest of the day.